Welcome to Future Shocks Global Geopolitical Outlook Debate hosted by DMI. I am Maya Hujaj and I'll be your moderator. To my left, please find carefully, uh, our carefully selected guests and I will introduce them. This, uh, initially, we have Dr. Ian Brimmer, President of Eurasia Group, young global leader, and he is on the Global Agenda Council on Geopolitical Risk. Also, Dr. Wu Chimbu, Professor at Fudan University, People's, Re People's Republic of China, and he is on the Global Agenda Council on Geopolitical risk as well. Uh, also find the Honorable Kevin Rudd, Member of Parliament in Australia, Global Agenda Council on the Fragile States, in addition to Dr. Lisa Anderson, the President of the American University in Cairo, Cairo Egypt, who is on the Global Agenda Council on the United States. Welcome to this panel and welcome, uh, dear audience. We will start by defining what the uh, risks are, the future risks are, and the future shocks. We will start with you, Dr. Anderson, and then we will move on um, as we go. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. I think it's from the perspective of Cairo in any event, um, I think the most important global issues are twofold. One of which is the changes that are taking place in this region. Um, and in many respects, the kind of tectonic changes that, are, that we are witnessing in the Middle East represent um, something of the same quality of what happened after the First and Second World Wars, but without a world war. So it's hard to, to really have a, a sense of the magnitude of this, but I think it's clearly going to have a global impact um, on that same sort of scale. And the other thing, and I will leave some of the other issues to other panelists that I think we really need to be thinking about, and again, this region points it out very dramatically, um, the political consequences of climate change. Um, all of this region is very vulnerable, and I think that will become clear more and more quickly. Mr. Rudd, uh, where do you think we are in, mat uh, in terms of alert? Should we raise the red alert, or are we still at orange, yellow? How dangerous is it for the, the political uh, views now? I would give it a middle shade of orange um, rather than uh, anything more intense than that because that would just be dramatic and unproductive. Let me make um, a few quick points. I see three um, potential um, uh, significant geopolitical risks in our hemisphere, the Asian hemisphere, three elsewhere, and one what Nick Gowing would describe to as a black swan event. Um, the um, three in our part of the world are as follows. Uh, number one, the, you may have been following the events in the South China Sea. I don't think anyone in the South China Sea actually wants conflict, but I am deeply concerned, as someone who's followed this for the last 20 or 30 years, of crisis and conflict through miscalculation, uh, through the absence of confidence and security building measures. Number two, and it's quite different, uh, in the East China Sea, uh, you've seen a lot of reporting of the um, competing nationalisms in China and Japan over Diaoyudao or Senkoku, depending on which side of that argument you happen to fall. This is quite different to the South China Sea. It involves quite ancient nationalisms, which have nothing to do with the South China Sea. It's China and Japan, a very rich and uh, difficult history. And I sometimes become concerned that uh, the management of um, domestic nationalisms could actually take those relationships beyond the tipping point. The third one I'd point to is uh, rarely debated, but rarely discussed. China now, with its new leadership transition, which I'm delighted about. I think the new group of leaders are a first-class group of individuals. But they face a formidable challenge in changing the Chinese economic growth model. Is this a geoeconomic or geopolitical risk? That's a question of taxonomy. But in terms of where that goes, if there is a failure in the implementation of the new growth model, the political implications for that within China and beyond are significant. Th three quick ones in this hemisphere. Iran, we'll talk about, I'm sure. Uh, the, the total irredeemable collapse of the Middle East peace process and where that leads, and I'm deeply concerned about prospects there. Pakistan is this a year when we reach a tipping point uh, because if there is, and never forget where we've reached to with uh, Pakistani-India relations. And in terms of black swan events, um, I would say we've all been focused on uh, Superstorm Sandy. Um, we can have uh, a long epistemological debate about um, what causes these things. But the bottom line is extreme weather events are becoming more frequent, more intense around the world, and they are likely to affect massive urban concentrations more. 
and therefore the possibility of this actually flipping us into an entirely different way of uh, dealing with each other uh, should be on our radar screen together with the software systems and political systems to respond. And where is Australia from that? Just south of all of those. <laughs> So, um, and so the great wonder for being Australia is that we're far enough away from everything not to be too concerned and therefore we seek to be creatively engaged in everything. Look, for us, uh, Asia is our home. The Asian uh, hemisphere is our home. We are integrally involved in every institution within Asia, perhaps bar one. Um, so for us, uh, these three ones are big. The global climate change debate, which my colleague referred to before, affects us all equally, whether we like it or not. Um, therefore, for us, um, uh, as citizens of the world, as a middle power with global interests and with regional interests, we are deeply engaged with that set of seven that I referred to just now. Uh, Dr. Chimbo, as well, I would move the same almost question to you, um, but in the context of China. China is now raising, how do they see the global, the, let's say, the geopolitical outlook, and where are the future shocks? Well, um, coming from China, um, I'm very much concerned about the, um, the anxiety on the part of the United States and Japan vis-a-vis uh, -vis China's uh, rise. Uh, the United States, as the hegemonic power, they're very much concerned with the China's uh, economic, political, and security influence in this region. Although, you know, economically, they think there are both challenges and opportunities, but on the political and security front, I think if you look at U.S. policy in the last two years in this region, people to, to Asia or rebalance to Asia, I think it was very much driven by the desire to counterbalance China's rising influence in this region. This not only has uh, led to rising tension between Beijing and Washington, but has also encouraged some other regional members mm -hmm. to take advantage of the U.S. people to, to this region to push their own agenda. So this is why you have seen more you know, instability, more problems in this region when the U.S. began to shift more resources to this part of the world. So that's my concern about China, U.S. Japan, uh, US relations. Now for Japan, uh, I think, I mean, as I noticed, um, as China surpassed Japan economically in 2010, this has caused a big anxiety in mm -hmm. Japan. And some people believe that you know, Japan will gradually drift to a more disadvantageous position vis-a-vis -vis China in the future. So something has to be done by Japan uh, bilaterally with the United States or unilaterally by itself or, uh, or collectively with other, other regional members to really to reshape a regional se se security environment. You think that the, uh, the uh, uh, China surpassing Japan economically is what triggered what's happening now in the China Sea? Uh, well, if you look at the uh, China Sea issue, uh, that's an old issue. Why, you know, the game is changing in recent years. I think some people in Japan, they believe that if Japan has an opportunity to push its own agenda, that has been in the recent several years. The more time goes on, the more disadvantages Japan will be in that position. So they wanted to push this issue, especially this year before China's leadership transition. So tactically, they think that was a good time for Japan to push their own agenda. And also remember, Japan has had a very weak and volatile political leadership at home. They change prime minister almost every year. So if, if you have a weak political leadership, it's more likely the leader will become the hostage to populism and nationalism. And the leaders are likely to take a short-sighted view about its foreign relations. So this can explain why you know, this old issue becomes so hard and heated uh, uh, in recent years, especially for this year. So that's why I'm concerned about you know, China's relations with both the United States and Japan. Dr. Bremer, do you agree with this issue in China and do you see it happening uh, in other places around the world? Well, I think that the way to define the risk in Asia is broadly around China rising. Mm -hmm. It's not just territorial issues. Uh, and it does bring, I know Australia is far away, 
uh, and if you define it very narrowly as territorial, then you get to skirt that issue. Um, but of course, when the Australians are looking to the U.S. as part of the pivot and American Marines are showing up in Darwin, we understand that Australia is very much a part of this issue. Um, and, and the concern of a United States, which still plays a dominant security role in much of Asia, while China is playing a much more dominant economic role in Asia, and those powers are shifting very dramatically. Japan is where this is playing out most dangerously. I agree completely with Shinbo, and I agree about it um, because in Japan, not only has the power balance shifted dramatically, where the Chinese no longer need Japanese investment dollars, and they don't need technology, they can get most of that from South Korea and Taiwan, and so they feel much more assertive and the underlying relationship between China and Japan has never been promising. So the ja uh, unlike many other countries in the region where the Chinese feel they can sort of swamp them economically and then win politically, with Japan, China's strategy is one more of assertiveness and isolation. And the Japanese have nowhere else to go. So this is the third and second largest economies in the world. They've shifted places recently. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Shinbo's also right that the United States has really focused on this part of the world. Obama does not like doctrine, mm -hmm. but to the extent he has doctrine, mm -hmm. it is economic statecraft mm -hmm. and it's the pivot to Asia. Both of those things are hedging against a rising China that might display behaviors the U.S. doesn't like. Is it containment? No, but uh, Obama just referred to China for the first time as an adversary. If those tensions continue to rise, it will look like China as containment, and a lot of countries will act as if it might be containment. And this is clearly, I mean, this, there are risks in the Middle East. I think Syria is by far the largest. Um, and there are risks geopolitically around Europe that are important. But the impact of China moving towards becoming the world's largest economy, when it will still be an authoritarian state, a state capitalist economy, and it will be poor, it, by far is the largest geopolitical risk in the world today. Nothing else is close, including everything we see in this region. If uh, I think you all agree about ch China's rise and being the biggest um, geopolitical uh, risk around, um, I, th I think we got everyone mentioning China, but no one has mentioned the European Union. Where do you see, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, the European Union from all this geopolitical risk? Well, I think one of the reasons why you see the um, uprising and the turmoil in the Middle East that you see today is partly because of the exhaustion of the older great powers. So when we talk about China, it's not merely China rising, it's also the eclipse of a, a world regime that had lasted for decades and decades. Um, so from that point of view, I think it's as much what's not there as what's there that is shaping the way the world looks like. So the United States, because of the economic crises, the, you know, the preoccupation with domestic politics, the, the echo of the end of the Cold War, the United States simply doesn't have to care very much about the rest of the world the way it did. And it is focused on China. It is completely focused on Asia. The Europeans similarly are sort of preoccupied with their own challenges, are not as globally active as they once were. Um, and so that leaves a opportunity for local, regional, domestic dynamics in the Middle East itself. Um, and then the question is really, will that draw attention fr from the issues of China's rising? Um, and in that sense, I think China may be the most important in the long run, but I can certainly see everybody being diverted by problems in this region. Um, Please, yeah. Yeah, just on the question of Europe, which you pose, from our hemisphere, Asia, um, in geopolitical terms, uh, Europe has become largely irrelevant. Just <laughs> stating a fact. Europe is irrelevant. Oh, the, in the geopolitical European, terms, that's what he said. <laughs> I, I'm stating this as starkly as possible because uh, I happen to believe it's true. In geopolitical terms, Europe has become largely irrelevant for two reasons. Foreign, in foreign policy terms, it's turned inward. Uh, with the exception of Libya and um, parts of the uh, so-called Arab Spring, uh, largely it's been, its foreign policy energies have been dedicated towards the expansion question and the management of challenges to its east, namely Russia. And secondly, um, to state the, the obvious of the obvious, 
uh, the euro crisis has further sapped internal European energies and, frankly, external confidence about the European, shall I say, foreign policy agenda beyond this continent. That's as we see it in our part of the world. The point about China, if I could just uh, add to what was said before, and I think to challenge a point which you used, you said China equals, the rise of China equals the greatest uh, geopolitical risk. Well, uh, for fear of incurring wrath in Washington, I just see it as, um, frankly, at least a challenge. I wouldn't actually describe it as a risk. Um, it's the question of how we all engage this phenomenon. It is a natural phenomenon. Rising economy, second largest in the world, 30 years in the making, it's there. The question we need to put to our Chinese friends, and we constantly do, is this. For a century, you've dreamed of becoming a great power, of becoming a strong and wealthy power. Now that that is becoming evident, how do you choose to use that power within the region and within the world, within the regional order, to the extent that it exists in Asia, which is very thin, and the global order, which we've inherited since 1945, based on a series of assumptions and values from the victorious Western English-speaking democracies in 1945. But my last point is about the, um, uh, to um, now take up a challenge from my Chinese colleague mm -hmm. about uh, the, the pivot to Asia. Uh, let's just get down to some mathematics here. When people use the term pivot to Asia by the US administration, they prefer the, the term rebalance. What effectively it means is that in the context of a global drawdown of US uh, military uh, assets uh, by a large order of magnitude, uh, you will see a net, uh, significant net reduction in Europe. You will see the status quo in Asia. Uh, you will not see a net increase. You will see the status quo. Uh, the message which the US has sought to convey to the countries of Asia, which by and large they have welcomed, is that there'll be no net strategic withdrawal of the United States from the Asian hemisphere and from the Asia Pacific and the Asia Indian Ocean region. That's quite a different um, matter. Vis-a-vis -vis the Darwin point in Australia, we've been an ally of the United States since 1941, before People's China was ever founded. And it was founded as an alliance, alliance against the Japanese, for goodness sake, in the middle of the war. Um, in terms of military cooperation with the United States. This is what has fundamentally altered the global strategic balance. In the past, uh, we had um, at any one time 1,500 US Marines uh, rotating out of Darwin every three months. Now we have 2,500 US Marines rotating every six months. Now that's got the IISS reprinting the global strategic balance as a result. In fact, <laughs> it's just a nonsense. It's uh, basically as it was, not much different at all. I, I've just noticed that you're writing, uh, Dr. Chen Bu, you have something to say? Well, um, I agree with uh, Kevin Root that China's rise in itself is not necessarily a uh, risk, but really it's how the other countries react to China's rise. So that's a big challenge. From a Chinese perspective, I think three things contributed to China's rise. China's opened up and reform in the last three decades, globalization and peace among the, the major powers. I think China wants to maintain all the three key conditions. But the real challenge is how other countries, particularly the United States and Japan, they can adjust to the rise of China. Don't so, you think that um, when Australia comes cl cl uh, closer to Japan, that might ruin its security uh, friendships with other countries like the United States? That's a very uh, interesting question uh, related to uh, um, Kevin Roo's remarks. I think Australia recently has become more proactive uh, in regional political and security affairs and has uh, conducted more security collaboration with the United States, partly for two reasons. One is that they want to get the security insurance while economically they are doing much closer to China. So they want to keep a balance. That's what you said, economically China on security front in the United States. Another thing is what I, we call the mid um, power uh, phenomena. The mid powers when they see the major powers play together, they are concerned to be marginalized. So they don't want to see this region to be really a kind of a G2 uh, a region, China, the United States. They want to stay engaged, want to stay uh, relevant. So they want to do something sometimes to draw the attention from the major powers and also to show that, hey, don't forget us, we are relevant. So Australia is an important factor in this regard for better or for worse for U.S.-China relations. 
We discuss every time we talk, we go back to China again. Does that make you feel that the, or do you think, and I know you have an opinion on this, that it's no longer monopoly, there's, it's not a monopoly anymore, there's not one superpower. Will we see a rise of a new superpower or the power will not be clear anymore? No, uh, I, I, well, uh, in 10, 20, 30 years, life can change. But for the purposes of, I think, the perspective of this group, we're not seeing the rise of a new superpower. We're not talking much about the United States. We're talking a lot about China. This, is, of course, it takes two to tango. And in part, this is a problem of the United States and China. Uh, the order that was created after World War II uh, that, that uh, Kevin refers to um, is a U.S. order. It was American friends and American allies, but it was, it was created by the United States. The World Bank sounds nice and global, so does the World Series. Mm -hmm. There's a Canadian team, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an American institution. And, and the Chinese don't accept that. And they, uh, they shouldn't. But the American perspective, I mean, if, there, if there's been a way to talk about China over the last few years, it's been this term responsible stakeholdership, which Robert Zellick, probably one of the most esteemed China watchers in the United States, coined. And the idea was, well, China, now you're becoming wealthy, so you need to be a responsible stakeholder. Well, the Chinese response is, well, wait a second. You want us to act like a developed state, but we're not. We're still developing. We, we can't expend the kind of resources that you do on the rest of the world. And secondly, you're asking us to play by rules and within institutions that you created. And we fundamentally don't accept that. So conflict is coming, right? I mean, you know, it was, I think it was Trotsky that once says, you know, you, you, you don't want war, but war wants you. Okay. Now, I'm not suggesting there's going to be a military fight between the U.S. and China, but we know that there is a cyber war going on between the two countries, despite the mutual independence that exists economically. We know that if you talk to American CEOs, their views of China and Australian CEOs and European CEOs, and most importantly, Japanese CEOs, their view of China in the last year is radically different than it was five years ago, ten years ago, in part because of size, but in part because there's a different system. There's not rule of law. There's opacity. It's state capitalist. I am suggesting that that is, yes, a risk. It's a risk. I mean, I don't care why you don't want to call it a risk. Like in America, Romney doesn't want to call China the biggest geopolitical challenge. He instead says it's Russia. It's like China's become Voldemort for some reason. It's a name that can't be spoken, right? But the reality is, if there is a risk out there, it's the risk that the rise of China upsets the global apple cart. It is bigger than Russia and India and Brazil and South Africa, all of those economies. Add them together, you still don't get China. There's no BRICS. Stop with the BRICS. It's China. That's what we focus on. And, and, and that is a risk. Uh, Ian. <laughs> I, I don't dispute the, the sort of very um, clear analytical approach, but keep in mind that, again, uh, every single American president since Truman has been surprised by something that happened in the Middle East and has been distracted. So I don't, you know, it's from, you know, the 67 war to the oil price shocks to the Iranian revolution to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait to the Arab Spring. There is all the analysis you can do, you still find that the, from the point of view of the United States in any event, China may be the big issue, but it's going to be ex eclipsed sometimes by things that are far more urgent. And I think the urgency, that, so when you do, as you know, risk analysis, some of it is going to be about urgency. And I have to say there is an urgency to the character of the challenges in this part of the world now. Before, uh, before you speak, Dr. Uh, Chinbu, if you don't mind, we just need to uh, welcome Al Habib Ben Yahya, the Secretary General of the Arab Maghreb uh, Union uh, in Rabat. Welcome, and he has just uh, joined us. We were just uh, discussing mainly China in the uh, geopolitical risks, but that is not our aim. We're trying to move away from uh, that. Uh, Dr. Chin, uh, Chinbu, you had something to add. Well, uh, two quick points. Uh, one is that to uh, um, Ian's uh, point uh, that China uh, was not involved when the regional order or even the international order was created. But that, that doesn't mean that China uh, uh, totally opposed this regional order and international order. To be fair, I think China's uh, development over the last 30 years 
has uh, benefited a lot from this current, you know, uh, regional and international system, especially on the economic front. So we, we don't want to overthrow the system. We see some problems and we want to reform it. And secondly, if you want China to be a stakeholder, you need to give us more stakes, right? Just give you one example. In 2010, IMF agreed to raise the representation to quota share for the emerging economies. But so far, the United States has not yet approved it. So two years have passed. You are, not, you are not, just not willing to give China more stake. How can you ask us you know, to play a large role? And another point is, you say, you know, no BRICS, China. That's, in China, we don't talk about the rise of China. We talk about the rise of the, a group of emerging countries, like India, like Brazil, like Africa. So we think this is a phenomenon largely created by globalization. And we reach out to these countries. We think that should be, uh, you, you know, a help for a phenomenon. You make a bigger pie, and everyone will have a larger share of it. So that's how we view the world. We don't, we don't just talk about the rise of China. We talk about the rise of a group of emerging markets. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenal change that we're looking at. And um, I respect uh, our Middle Eastern colleagues because I think what's just been said is right. There's always this out of left field phenomenon which emerges. And uh, it always has a capacity to, shall I say, affect the global order in one means or another, most recently through the uh, international manifestation of terrorism and uh, earlier through uh, its impact on the global economy through the price of oil. So let's just recognise that as a continuum. My own list, the Middle East cluster represents half of what we've got to be concerned about, and that's speaking from the perspective of Asia. But let's go to the global phenomenon and the regional phenomenon called the rise of China. This is a major global event. Uh, when China becomes the world's largest economy, which it will do in the next decade, this will be the first time since King George III was on the throne that a non-English speaking, non-Western, non-democracy will be the world's largest economy. That is a fact. Now, the question is, what do we do about it with our Chinese friends? And this uh, half decade to a decade, while that transition is underway, is the critical time to engage intelligently with a roadmap for the future, how we manage this transition. The reason I object to the term risk, to go back to what's used before, is that in its use, uh, the term, the language itself, implies that all the action therefore must occur on China's part to comply with the order. That's why I'm concerned about it. The truth is, as you said before, it does take two to tango. And, it's, and in our view, despite the fact that it will offend certain Latin American dance classes, in Asia it takes several to tango. Mm -hmm. China, the US and the rest of us as well, including these, including these pesky middle powers that you referred to. <laughs> uh, quarter, of a, quarter of a billion Indonesians, you know, uh, 50 or 60 million Koreans and one or Brazil. two of us. And one or two of us down the south. But here's the challenge. In our hemisphere, what are people doing? They are hedging against this challenge. On the one hand, they want to engage with China, not just economically but politically, within the framework of the continuation of the post-45 rules-based order. They expect and hope that China, having benefited from that order, both in terms of peace and stability and global economic engagement and the rules of uh, open economies, uh, will sustain and contribute to that uh, order, as Zelik said, through becoming a continued positive stakeholder. The hedge in Asia is this. Because China has not articulated its long-term doctrine of what it will do with national wealth and power in our hemisphere and globally, other than use saccharine terms like which means harmonious world, uh, we all sit back and say, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so the hedge is this, that not just Australia, but Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, all are saying, well, what if this turns out badly? And what if, in fact, uh, there are other forces which begin to, shall I say, exhibit a broader Chinese nationalism? Mm -hmm. So the solution to this is as follows. Our friends in China, under what I think is going to be a very good new leadership under Xi Jinping, do have a responsibility to take their foreign policy declaration beyond the current, shall I say, nebulous statements into something much more coherent, and secondly then engage, at least in Asia, with the Americans and the rest of us in shaping for the first time a rules-based security order in Asia, which we do not have. We don't have any confidence in security building measures. We have no hotlines. We have nothing. So when a crisis occurs, let me tell you, it becomes automatically potentially inflammatory. Uh, 
before we move on to the uh, next, uh, next part, I would like to get uh, uh, Mr. Ben Yahya's uh, uh, intake on this. Do you agree with Mr. Bremer that the rise of China is the biggest risk we are facing uh, in the geopolitical outlook, or it's, you shouldn't call it a risk, as Mr. Rad uh, Rad said? Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to be a bit late. I traveled uh, several times to China. And I, we know what the Chinese are doing in North Africa. Excellent work. Most of the big project, infrastructure, port, facilities, airport, I mean, the Chinese are in. So is the case in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think well, you can rest assured that uh, the major infrastructure project, where there is a bidding system, you know for sure that uh, the, the winner would be a Chinese company. Mm. And uh, well, it's a competition, and I think uh, so much the better. Uh, and I think the second thing, the Chinese expert in uh, the Maghreb, in country, talk Arabic. There is more than 50,000 Chinese experts in some of the countries in North Africa. And uh, they are fully integrated. And, uh, and I think some of them even are uh, very courageous to get married with uh, <laughs> Maghrebian girls. <laughs> and uh, I think this is, and I, the last time I saw them, it was in Mauritania, in the fishing business. Uh, I think they are in competition with a number of other countries, including, including Japan and some European countries. And for the competition's sake, I think they are doing a wonderful job. Uh, so is uh, their role in other sub-Saharan African countries uh, is essential. Uh, whether we can appreciate uh, the presence of Chinese expert in a number of African countries or Maghrebian countries, it's a question of what political evaluation. May but I be I, the devil's advocate here and say, don't you think that there are just like little armies and uh, uh, construction army, uh, fishing army, uh, economical army? Well, I didn't, I didn't see them wearing uh, army suits, <laughs> but they are, uh, I mean, uh, taken as civilian experts, mm -hmm. being hired for uh, their bidding uh, capabilities, uh, and they are competing with a lot of European and uh, other Western companies. Uh, so their role is uh, really appreciated economically, so to say, for the big infrastructure project. That's what I can say. Let's uh, move on to the threats that uh, might be facing. Do you think that we are running out of uh, resources, Dr. Anderson? I think it's clear that the, the, there's a combined challenge in climate change and natural resources, one of which is, um, I think, certainly for areas of, that are essentially arid, like the Middle East and North Africa, I think there really is a significant um, concern about global warming itself and the uh, agriculture that is dependent on regular rainfall and so forth is likely to be more and more stressed. And so that's one thing. Secondly, I think there are going to be these black swan events. I mean, I, I do subscribe to the theory that the weather will be more volatile around the world as the temperature increases. I think we are completely unprepared for that, as New York just demonstrated. Um, and so I think there are going to be those kinds of challenges. Um, and I think the, the, the tension that will arise around redistribution of resources um, and the likely rising global commodity prices as a result of changes in bread baskets around the world, I think all of those things are going to converge to create real, real stresses in the system. So yes, I think these, for those various reasons, I think we should be paying a great deal more attention than we are now to what the, the climate change challenge represents. Do you think, uh, Mr. Rudd, that um, other resources such as 
the human angle of the resources, if you look at the demographics, the unemployment, how do you think that will affect our geopolitical outlook? Well, in this body, the World Economic Forum, I'm chair of the Fragile States um, Global Affairs Council. And one of the things we're looking at is if you look at um, uh, those who would um, self-describe as fragile states or, um, or fragile situations around the world, um, one of the clear barometers is uh, large-scale uh, youth unemployment. Uh, we've talked about this, we've talked about this, and we've talked about it for a thousand times. But if there is one thing which is absolutely essential in policy terms to cause a fragile state to become a non-fragile state, it is using the mechanisms available domestically and through international intervention to create jobs at scale for young people in particular. Um, I'm, I'm no Middle Easternist, I'm no Arabist, but if I look at, uh, frankly, the magnitude of youth unemployment in Egypt, uh, this I find quite frightening uh, in terms of um, long-term trajectories. That's one dimension. If I could simply back up um, what uh, my colleague was saying just before about food security. Uh, this lapses into and out of global fashionability, depending on which forum you are, you are attending. But the bottom line is this. One clear impact of climate change over time is increasing unpredictability of food production. We speak of that as Australia as a not insignificant uh, breadbasket for a part of the world. We are large-scale net food exporters and have been for 150 years. We know there's the impact uh, within our country. If you look at the last uh, uh, crop growing season in the United States and what happened there with extraordinary drought, um, this is going to lead to a volatility in food security questions of, I think, a historic, uh, we'll put it this way, of historic proportions. Therefore, in our calculation for, let's call it global strategic stability, whether it falls into the category of predictable black swan events, which is a contradiction in terms, but shall I say a slow moving small b black swan event, mm -hmm. the food security question shaped by climate change factors um, is, I believe, out there looming large. We, we measure this also by the phenomenal recent interest in inbound investment in Australia from China, from the Middle East and elsewhere. People desperately at a national level concerned about their own hedges, about their long-term food security risks at home. Do you think that, um, would you like to add to this? If anyone would like to add to anything when you're speaking, I'd like to get contradictory views if possible. <laughs> but so far you're all agreeing that um, the biggest issue will be um, um, the uh, food, uh, food security maybe. Do you think there are other issues that would affect the resources or other resources that would uh, affect the geopolitical outlook? Well, uh, if you look at the uh, ongoing um, party congress in China and trying to tell where you know, China is moving um, in the next decade. Um, I think China has somehow passed the stage when the focus was really on economic growth, on the growth rate, but rather on the quality of the growth. So, you know, from the leader's uh, uh, open remarks, you can hear, you know, uh, phrases like food security, energy security, uh, environmental issues. So these are really uh, uh, the issues they are concerned, and also about, of course, social security. So to some extent, China is also standing at a turning point from purely economic growth to comprehensive uh, 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 social economic development. This kind of adjustment in China's strategy will have a lot of impact on international market in the years to come. Um, in, re in that regard, and aside from the natural problems that we might have, don't you think that the technology as well it might be another a big source to reckon with in the future and it might have an effect in the shift of power or the geopolitical risks? Oh, it's very clear, though. I mean, one thing I would say, I agree with the whole panel here on, on the question of food, um, but I think that the geopolitical backdrop for that food conflict is that countries do not have uh, international transparency around the marketplace. You will see more resource nationalism. Mm -hmm. You will see countries like China and Saudi Arabia going out and buying land. And that will create recrimination in countries where, you know, when there are droughts, you're going to export soybeans and we're going to starve. That's not going to work very well. But, uh, but you're, you're going to have a lot of export controls. You're going to have concerns with that volatility that will be politically induced because we don't have global institutions. Klaus Schwab made that very clear. I mean, when the World Economic Forum is one of the few 
places that truly looks global in terms of its outlook, uh, that, that tells you that a lot of what you used to have over the past decades has sort of broken down. Clearly, that's a problem. On technology, um, it's a big topic, and there are a lot of ways you can take it. Um, I'm not someone who believes that there is a revolution waiting to happen tomorrow in China. Uh, after 35 years of 10% plus state-directed growth, there are a lot of people who are more satisfied with the Chinese government in China than there are in, with the American government in the United States or with the European governments in Europe. We can say that, right? Um, but, but China is trying to run a 21st century economy with a 20th century political system. And 350 million Chinese on Weibo, the Chinese Twitter, talking about Bo Shalai mm -hmm. and talking about Xi Jinping not being there for two weeks is anathema to the Chinese notion of governance where it's no business who we choose to be our seven top leaders. Well, th that's a problem. And, and that will cause more risk aversion and it will make it harder for China to engage in the political reforms long term that will make them uh, more effective as a player. There are also, as I mentioned, there is a war going on in cyber. The United States is winning that war state versus state against China. The United States is losing that war with its companies against Chinese companies. And we don't talk about this much because American companies don't want to admit when they've lost a lot of stuff that's dangerous. Asian banks don't want to admit when they've lost but they a lot of stuff. But the Philippine banks have just come out two weeks ago and said they've had unprecedented cyber attacks from China. So it must be bad because it's clearly going to impact the way they, they're looked at in the market. This is a growing danger. There was a story in, in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago about a huge um, institution being attacked for a small uh, password that was uh, probably for an email or an iTunes ac account. And this was just to show them that we can hack, hack your system and that was a huge in institution that could not be hacked. What do you think this will lead in the future? Will this help in the geopolitical outlook, Mr. Ben Yahya? Or will it affect me, the geopolitical outlook? Let me ask, add one thing. As far as food security is concerned, for the whole world and for China. The Chinese noodles are made of rice. There is no competition with Italian spaghetti. And uh, I, I think they have their own system of uh, dealing with their food, but I think with the increase of population, uh, it might be a problem of production for China, and they're importing also a lot of wheat now. Uh, maybe in the near future, we'll see the consumption of wheat product uh, raising because of the new system and the new fashion in uh, the food uh, consumption. But uh, as far as the, the issue of uh, Chinese uh, role in the world as politics are concerned, uh, I followed the Chinese uh, role in a number of uh, countries where we see uh, expert being more integrated in the system than any other nationality. And uh, this has an, a very big impact on their acceptance within a number of countries. I'm talking about the continent of Africa uh, and even in the Maghreb. Uh, and I, we see them uh, not bringing a lot of workers, but a lot of engineers. Because we do have workers and we don't want them to come with an army of workers uh, to create unemployment for other sectors. So that's the combination we reach with the Chinese when they have big project, for instance, a big channel built in Tunisia, 96 kilometers, to carry on the surplus of water in the north to the center and the south was done by the Chinese, but with Chinese engineers and Tunisian workers. Thank you. Yes, you had something to say. I actually, I want to propose something about the role of technology, which isn't um, sort of cybersecurity, but I actually think that one of the things we're seeing around the world is generational shift. Um, we all of a certain age will 
attest to the fact that it was our children who taught us how to use the next technology to program the VCR or to work the new phone and so forth. That has happened around the world. It has happened to everyone. And it has changed the relations of that generation who taught their parents how to do something. When you think about it, how many of us as children taught our parents to do things? Very few. But this generation has had that experience from the beginning. And I actually believe that that is creating a different culture of a generation that has understood things before their parents did. They are less deferential to authority. They are more knowledgeable about the future than the generation that is currently in power. And I think that is creating, you see, honestly, I think that's one of the things that's happened in this region. Um, keep in mind that mobile phone penetration in Egypt is 110%. This is a very highly savvy population in terms of these technologies. And it is that generation that not only adopted it, but taught everyone else how to use it. I think that's going to happen everywhere, and I think it is going to change relations among generations and therefore among authority figures and the next generations coming up. Mr. Essentially within China, and I think more broadly across the world, the debate of the next decade is essentially one between globalists and nationalists. If I look at China itself, you can see both scripts on offer. There is a script for nationalism and even mercantilism. Um, and, um, and it's um, driven by certain, within, certain institutions within China. And uh, the security apparatus in China, including the PLA, are notoriously opaque. But they contribute to this debate. But also, it's not restricted to China. The security apparatus in other countries in the region uh, often look at reality through that sort of prism as well. There's also a globalist script in China, uh, which is they recognize how much uh, the country has benefited and they personally benefit from being part of a global rules-based system based on open economies, increasingly open societies, and dare I say it, the possibility of more open politics as well. Two caveats, though. One. The, um, uh, the um, social media revolution in China uh, cuts both ways. Uh, I, I subscribe to Chinese Weibo. Every night I tap out my messages in Chinese to my, my 700,000 Chinese uh, Twitter followers. And uh, I get two sorts of responses. One is they like the look of my grandkids. Uh, two, uh, they think that you know, my written Chinese should be improved. But there's a third response. When there's a big event uh, which occurs in Sino-Japanese relations, there is a ferociously nationalist response from young people. That's the first caveat. The assumption, therefore, that young people who are wired are automatically globalists has to have a caveat attached to it. Uh, the second point uh, I would make is that this leadership, which is being um, elected through the uh, meeting of the 18th Party Congress in Beijing, my own judgment of it is that I think on balance it is globalist. On balance, I think it is reformist. On balance, I think it sees the future. The next challenge for the next five years is further reforms of the domestic economic model. If that succeeds, my own sense is, because these are very smart people, they know that the forces of social and political liberalization are at work in China through an increasingly open media and social media, where the discussions about hitherto quite sensitive matters are discussed, that I think in a second Xi Jinping term, you may see the beginnings of um, structural political reform. Not full-blown democracy, but of a new level of structural political reform. Dr. Chen Bui. Well, uh, first related to uh, this point, um, sitting in China, you, you watch the debate every day about economic policy, social policy, politics, and foreign policy. You know, you get a very different impression from, you know, people outside of China, they think, well, this is opaque, you know, this is, you know, only one voice. You know, today China has become so pluralistic that on any major policy issues, you can hear a debate and different voices. So that's the one thing. And the second thing is about this kind of technology issue and cyber uh, security issue. Um, well, technology brings about progress and improvement, but it also creates vulnerability. Uh, cyberspace security in China, we are, you know, China's computers, they suffer from attacks from both within China and from outside of China. According to the public source, 2011, the attack on the computers in China uh, increased by 200%. Uh, 
than the previous year, than 2010. And among those attacks, over 20% come from the United States. Now, for the first half of this year, this has been increased by another 200%. And you, from, in terms of the sources of the hackers, US number one, Japan number two, Korea number three. So China is also a victim of this kind of you know, uh, vulnerability. So this issue should be, be put into a broad context of global governance because this is a new frontier, a new domain. We do not yet have you know, international norm and institution for how to deal with the global uh, uh, cyber uh, security issue. This is the right time to sit down to discuss this, this issue. The United States has the most advanced AI technology in this world. I mean, we know it established its cyberspace warfare headquarters in 2010. We know what it's doing with Iran, but that's just, you know, they publicize it. There are many things that the United States are doing. They are not necessarily made it public. So I hope that, you know, this is a time for countries, especially major powers, to sit down to reach consensus on the cyber security issue. Um, going back to what uh, Dr. Anderson said, that there is a shift, a generation shift. Do you think that means that we will redefine the terms that we look at now and we will redefine the outlook in a couple of years or the, the risks in the future? Oh, I think we are redefining the outlook, but I think that young people and the way that they um, consume information is not globalized in the way we expected it was going to be. I mean, the, the Tom Friedman view of the world is that everyone gets more connected to everyone. Uh, and so you just wire the world and we'll all be together. Um, and the reality is that young people consuming news consume exactly what they want to hear. Right? Mm -hmm. They're consumers. Mm -hmm. And the, the, whether it's a government or it's a company like Google or Facebook or, or, or Weibo, uh, they all want to maximize the experience that these folks have. And they want to make a lot of money. So they allow you to get only what you want. That is polarizing. Right? That means that the average American who has, subscribes to a right-wing view gets overwhelmingly only media that confirms and bolsters right, that view. Mm -hmm. And the same for the left. Now, in the United States, that's actually not that dangerous because most Americans don't care. Most <laughs> Americans are much more interested in, you know, their hobbies and golf and cooking and politics is a hobby, but, you know, frankly, we're wealthy enough, it doesn't really matter. If, on the other hand, your primary identity and the thing you consume most is whether you are Israeli or Palestinian, whether you are Sunni or Shia, whether you believe that the Americans are or aren't supporting a China versus Japan position, that is radically dangerous. Mm -hmm. The first billion people that got wired were basically rich, and they were pro-status quo. A lot of the people that are getting wired now don't like the status quo, and for very good reason. Absolutely. That is not a positive trend for geopolitical stability. Let's be clear. And wiring a billion Chinese is not likely, I mean, I think, do a thought experiment. If you gave China a democratic vote today and you let them vote, would they end up electing a government that is more or less well disposed to the current world order and the United States of America? I think less, and with good reason. So they're not going to get the right to vote. And, and again, if the United States had the right to give them the right to vote, it's not clear to me they would. But they're not going to get it. And neither would the Australians. But but, I know, I know, I know, but you know. Um, the, the fact is, uh, they are not going to get the right to vote, but they are getting on internet, as, as the 700,000 followers of Kevin attest. They're choosing. They're choosing, and what they're choosing is not necessarily going to be in any way attractive to the folks that support the status quo. One of the biggest things out there has been this, this gap in rich and poor, which we see in the United States, within China and the rest, but that global gap matters too, and that is facilitating the nationalism versus globalization point that Kevin actually made. Um, I, we need to wrap up, so I, I will just take your views on this issue as well, the redefining terms, and we'll try to do it very quickly, because I think we can wrap it up with the generation uh, changing, and uh, we might need to redefine our geopolitical outlook. Please, Mr. Ben Yahya. I think getting into the politics, uh, don't forget that uh, many Chinese are living in the United States, in Europe, and a number of other countries. 
and the uh, number is increasing, and they are quite well appreciated. Some of those Chinese living in the United States for centuries are returning back to China as experts and are doing a wonderful job. I think in perspective, how China would be by the end of this 21st century is open for question, but I think the system itself is adapted to more than a billion people. And uh, whether you want to have a Western democratic democracy, it's a question of uh, uh, maybe appreciation of the, uh, the, the channel they are going through in order to let their people express more freely their opinion. Uh, this is happening if you compare what used to be uh, last century. I think China is making a big, uh, a big progress. So I, I won't be uh, just so categoric about making a judgment on the political system, whether there will be a spring in China, they have spring rolls, and uh, they, they like uh, what is going on in the, in the other countries in the world, and they learn very quickly. Uh, my own appreciation is that sooner or later, the system will get uh, more liberal. Economically, it's already there, but politically, it's in the coming. As well, Dr. Anderson. Um, I think the, the uh, new technologies have empowered a new generation. I think this new generation is not necessarily cosmopolitan. Um, I think it is often able to feed on itself and enthuse itself about more and more um, anti-authoritarian and anti-status quo positions. I think there isn't any doubt about that. Um, I think it is true, too, that there are, in essence, no rules in this new world. Um, so it's these, this generation is not only anti-authoritarian, just sort of congenitally, but there aren't really that many rules that govern how these technologies are going to be used and what is a productive as opposed to unproductive use of them. All of that's true, and I think that will be contributing to considerable instability in and of itself, a volatility in the world. Um, at the same time, I am congenitally and fundamentally optimistic about this. I think the um, opportunity for new people and new ideas to arise through these kinds of um, conversations, whether they're Twitter conversations or anything else, is enormously valuable. There's an energy and a dynamism in this world that I think cannot but, over the long run, be productive for all of us. Mr. Rudd? Um, three quick points. One is what we're talking about with the um, uh, management of uh, the rise of China is one of the big global three. Maintaining global um, financial and economic stability is number one. Um, uh, we're five years into this crisis and not yet out of it. Two, peaceful rise of China within the framework of uh, the continuing values of the international and regional rules-based orders. And three is climate change and the associated impacts. On this one, uh, the rise of China, this is my second point, I go back to emphasize again the critical question of uh, globalists and nationalists. The globalist script for national politicians in China is hard to explain because when they see its manifestations, it's not dissimilar to what you see in the West. The rich guys who are earning a lot of money and driving Maseratis around Beijing, they're the globalists. If I'm uh, Comrade Wang um, down in uh, Sichuan South uh, and I am still basically worrying about whether I've got four pigs or five and, I, I'm, and I'm asked a question about whether all this is worthwhile, um, it's very easy for them to hear a nationalist script instead. Similarly, I've got to say, in the West. The challenge in the West and the rest of the world is to explain the globalizing project in manners which actually cause there to be a net benefit to everybody. And that's why I'm a social democrat, for example. I believe in globalism, but frankly, with a social democratic conditionality, because people have got to have a buy-in, not just those at the top. And finally, on the China, China front, and this is my third point, uh, we in this decade have, I believe, a historically unique opportunity to shape the future. 
China, US and the rest of us in Asia can either repeat 300 years of disastrous European history leading up to 1945, or we can learn from that. I think our Chinese friends and the rest of us hopefully are smart enough to learn from that, but frankly, forums like the WEF and others like it now have a unique responsibility and opportunity to shape common concepts and agreements for the future. And like my colleague here, speaking from a Middle Eastern perspective, I'm equally a congenital optimist about the future of stability and prosperity in Asia. Mr. Uh, Dr. Chen Bu, can we uh, do it very quickly because we, we're going, running out of time, please? Well, uh, I think in the next 10 years, the Chinese leaders uh, will face challenges quite different from the last three decades. But I think the system and the leadership will be uh, flexible enough to adjust to these challenges. And I also believe most people in China they prefer stability and they, they, they have a more opti optimistic view of the future. So on the other hand, I think the power shift in the next decade will be uh, much larger in terms of scale. And this issue has to be handled very carefully. And I'm glad to say that what, econo what Economic Forum is playing a very important role in generating a wise and intellectual debate on this very important issue, and I want to say it continues to play this role ahead. Dr. Bremer? Um, I'm a general optimist because I'm here. Uh, but I, I am not in terms of the world order. And, and I, I say that because um, this extraordinary change, we think we've seen China rise. We haven't. The next 10 years will be radically more so than what we've seen. It is happening in a particularly difficult global environment. Number one, too many countries that matter to coordinate effectively. Number two, those new countries are both not particularly aligned with the old countries and they don't have the capacity to engage. Number three, America's allies are maximally distracted, uh, Europeans in particular. And number four, the United States does not want to play as much of a role globally as it has historically. Watch the third foreign policy debate, the U.S. presidential debate that didn't discuss foreign policy. Um, if you put those four things together, what you are hearing is that you have challenges which are historically very significant in scale that the world is less capable to respond effectively to than it has historically. Human beings should be fundamentally and congenitally optimistic because we're here, but we must be realistic that in historical perspective, the geopolitical risks right now are greater than they have been. They're likely to respond less than it has been. And thank God, we're now paying more attention to geopolitical risk now here at the WEF. I'm delighted for that. We are uh, on the cusp of a change beyond these imaginary borders, future shocks and redefined terms. Ultimately, we are witnessing a change in a generation, bringing an urgency to adapt to variants. We can no longer reflect on our past experiences. Should solutions arise, I hope we have discussed some of them or we have sort of discussed them today. I hope uh, there will be a way to apply them in the future. Thank you very much, esteemed guests, and thank you to the audience. Thank you.